Welcome to GAMAC4, the global meeting of global action against mass atrocity crimes. My name is Claire Duhl, and I'm your master of ceremonies over the next few days. Welcome to all of you who are joining us from around the world, Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia Pacific, and the Americas. We're looking forward to hearing from you, so do make comments in the chat and send in your questions in the Q&A. And tweet using hashtag prevention pays off and the Twitter handle at gamac underscore org. While we're waiting for more participants to connect, I'll just share with you some brief information about interpretation. We have simultaneous interpretation in French and Spanish, and you will find the icons on your screen. So without any further ado, Sylvia, over to you. Thank you, Claire. I am Sylvia Fernandez de Gurmendi. I come from Argentina. I am now the chair of GAMAC. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth global meeting of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes, GAMAC. While this is the first time online edition of a GAMAC global meeting, I am very pleased that it takes place since its postponement last year. Recording in progress. GAMAC global meetings bring the community together to reflect and bring concrete recommendations on atrocity prevention. The focus of GAMAC 4, strengthening national efforts to address hate speech, discrimination and prevent incitement is very topical as hate speech is an issue of growing concern. All continents are witnessing an increase in xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, persecution of Christians and other forms of discrimination against people because of their identity or belonging to a certain group, including women, refugees and migrants. This increase in various forms of discrimination and intolerance is reflected in the multiplication of hostile messages disseminated through the internet, social networks and other online and conventional media. Indeed, as recently stated by Secretary General Guterres, during UNESCO Ministerial Conference addressing hate speech through education, held on 26 October 2021, social media provides a global megaphone for hate. However, let us remember that hate speech is not an invention of the new technologies. Hate speech transmitted through both unconventional and conventional forms of communication including radio and print media, has served to transmit hostility and generate violence, including mass crimes, in the last 75 years. Hate speech has been a precursor of violence, from the Holocaust to Rwanda, Bosnia, Cambodia, or the current crisis against the Rohingya in Myanmar. The gravity of these events challenges us and reminds us of the urgency and importance of responding appropriately to the problem as a precursor of atrocity crimes. It is my hope that this fourth global meeting will reinforce GAMAC's aim to contributing to move from a culture of reaction to a culture of prevention. A year into my chairing GAMAC, I really look forward to seeing GAMAC's community in action, united and together against hate speech, discrimination and incitement. It is now my pleasure to officially open the online edition of our fourth global meeting of GAMAC, and I would gladly do this with the animated video that will now follow. Mass atrocities do not happen from one day to the next. They can and must be prevented on a permanent basis through responsive, efficient national mechanisms 
GAMAC is a global and inclusive network composed of states, civil society and academic institutions brought together by the belief that atrocity prevention is a permanent endeavor and that hatred and intolerance must be tackled from their earliest signs. Hate speech, discrimination and incitement are among these warning signals. But how to help each state with its unique history and culture to identify these signs? How can GAMAC ensure its global community supports national prevention efforts in all their diversity? Five years ago, over 25 African stakeholders answered these questions by starting GAMAC's first regional initiative, translating GAMAC's vision into culturally relevant concrete action. The Africa Working Group developed a manual and a training toolkit on the management of national prevention mechanisms. Sharing best practices from the region, it carried out empirical research on hate speech in Cameroon, Nigeria and South Sudan. No country is immune from genocide and prevention is certainly better than cure. And uh, my vision is to build and grow a Pan-African organization, a Pan-African working group that is robust and has robust national mechanisms in each part of, the, of Africa. Following in the Africa Working Group's footsteps, other regions have committed to bringing GAMAC's vision to their part of the world. The Asia-Pacific Study Group works on hate speech prevention and has compiled successful regional initiatives to promote tolerance and respect of diversity. The Americas Working Group, recognizing that women have been disproportionately affected by mass crimes, researches prevention in its region through a gender lens. A fourth initiative is now budding in Europe. These alliances are vital links between GAMAC's global scope and realities on the ground. Through local expertise, they ensure states can efficiently identify and combat early signs of hatred so that atrocities can be avoided. At a time when hatred is on the rise and solidarity is too often lacking, it is encouraging to see your dedication to prevention. Let us step up to protect the vulnerable, let us speak out against intolerance and hate, and let us stand up for human rights, our shared values, and our common humanity. Join our conversation on strengthening national efforts to address hate speech and discrimination and prevent incitement. Welcome to GAMAC 4. And now, as part of our efforts to encourage each of you to remain engaged, we will feature inspirational messages from members of the community. It is now my pleasure to introduce the first message from the Foreign Minister of Argentina, Santiago Cafiero. Como país que actualmente ejerce la presidencia de la GAMAC, le damos la bienvenida a esta cuarta conferencia, destinada a fortalecer los esfuerzos nacionales para combatir el discurso de odio, la discriminación y prevenir la incitación. Los discursos de odio socavan la cohesión social, y comprometen la vigencia de los derechos humanos y también pueden sentar las bases de la deshumanización, la estigmatización y la violencia en nuestras sociedades. Resulta difícil subestimar el rol que en la historia reciente han tenido las manifestaciones verbales de intolerancia, racismo, discriminación y xenofobia. En la Comisión de Delitos Atroces, incluido el genocidio. Frente a ello, existe una responsabilidad colectiva de movilizarnos contra los discursos de odio y en defensa de los derechos humanos y el Estado de Derecho. Más aún cuando las nuevas tecnologías y plataformas que nos conectan con el mundo también aumentan nuestra vulnerabilidad. Hoy más que nunca necesitamos de la cooperación y de acciones concertadas para hacer frente a estos nuevos desafíos. Les deseo jornadas productivas, de reflexión profunda y creativas y también que consigamos resultados concretos. As the Foreign Minister of Argentina says, we have a collective responsibility to address hate speech in this era of growing intolerance, the subject of our first panel discussion. 
After that panel, we'll take a 15-minute break before the chair of GAMAC moderates a discussion on hate speech as a precursor to genocide and other mass atrocity crimes. But that is not the end of the day. We'd like to invite you to take a stroll through Innovation Square. You can find out what is happening by clicking on the logo under the workshop icon. As I said before, we're really interested in hearing your thoughts, so do tweet using hashtag PreventionPaysOff and the Twitter handle at GAMAC underscore org. And of course, use the chat for comments and do share best practices. If you're having trouble with finding a session or need any other help, use the chat support in the little yellow icon at the bottom right of your screen. We're living in an era of intolerance where hate speech is on the rise. In our panel, we're going to be looking at the drivers of hate speech and how we address it while respecting freedom of expression. We have some of the most respected voices on the issue. So let me introduce Professor David Kay, Professor of Law at the University of California and former Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Teresa Ribeiro, the OSCE representative on the freedom of the media. And Dr. Taufik Jalassi, Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Communication and Information. So welcome, thank you very, very much for joining us. David, in particular, thank you for getting up so early because nobody wants to know how early it is in California at the moment. Uh, David, let's kick off with you and perhaps you can just tell us, you know, is there a definition of uh, hate speech that's globally accepted or globally applied worldwide? Uh, good morning from California, Claire, and thank you for that question. It's it's really wonderful to be on such a distinguished panel, uh, particularly for an organization chaired by my friend Sylvia Fernandez. Um, the, the question is extremely important. Uh, hate speech as a term, simply those two words put together, hate speech, does not have a well-accepted definition internationally. It is not a term of art in international law. Um, instead, international human rights law, in particular, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, on the one hand, guarantees everyone freedom of expression. That is the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. But at the same time, it allows for restrictions. And in particular, Article 20 of the, uh, of the Covenant requires states parties to prohibit national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to violence, hostility, or discrimination. And that is essentially where I think the common understanding of what we might discuss here as hate speech uh, might be. And that means that hate speech, as a matter of international law, really focuses in on the question of when does advocacy of hatred constitute incitement. So we tend to look toward incitement. And there's been a number of expert studies and um, resolutions adopted by organizations and law uh, concluded by organizations and courts, such as the European Court of Human Rights, that further refine how we understand hate speech. But essentially, when we think about hate speech as a matter of human rights law, as a matter of obligations of states, we're thinking about incitement. Thanks, um, David. Now, of course, those international uh, conventions, their uh, UN conventions, let me bring in Taufik into the discussion because I know that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, um, feels obviously very strongly about uh, hate speech. We heard uh, Sylvia quote him in her earlier remarks. So tell us very briefly about what the UN is doing on hate speech. Thank you, Claire. If I may add to what uh, Professor Kay has said and agree with him, there is no commonly accepted, agreed upon definition of hate speech. But I would like maybe to suggest the UN working definition, uh, which says, and quote here, it is any kind of communication in speech, writing, or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group 
on the basis who they are based on their religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender, or any other identity factor. So uh, uh, being at UNESCO, we are obviously a specialized UN agency. I want to contribute with this UN working definition on hate speech. Thank you, uh, Taufik. So we've got a working uh, definition. Um, as David was said, there's, there's no sort of globally agreed definition. Uh, Teresa, is that a problem that there is no uh, total agreement on what hate speech is? And I hope that we're going to be hearing from Teresa. Teresa, do you hear us? I think you might need oh, to unmute thank yourself. You. I'm now, uh, I think you can, you can hear me now. First of all, uh, thank you very much for having me today in this uh, wonderful panel. I want to greet my colleagues uh, in the panel. It's really, really a pleasure to discuss uh, today with you um, this very, very topical uh, issue for the reasons that uh, were uh, extensively explained by the former uh, the former speakers. Um, you know, my colleague said, "Okay, we have a working uh, we have a working definition." This was uh, what uh, what Dr. Tafik uh, said. Uh, Professor David Kay he pointed out uh, that uh, we need to find the right balance, and I think that's that's the problem to find the right balance uh, between freedom of expression and hate speech. Unfortunately, we see in many occasions uh, an abuse of the law, which means that uh, um, very quickly uh, we jump uh, and call hate speech everything that is protected by freedom of expression. And freedom of expression can uh, and, and should protect uh, um, uh, even speeches that uh, that are uh, offensive, that can shock, that can disturb, and they are protected by freedom of expression. Hate speech uh, is uh, something that is different and was uh, very well explained by both uh, of my colleagues in this panel. If it raises a problem, um, I think the problem is not so much the working definition, which is, of course, very important for the courts, um, but it's also the implementation of the laws. Uh, you know, the, and, and the independence of the judiciary plays a role and a very important role. And at the same time, as we are uh, more and more in a globalized and interconnected world, um, we can, because there is not an agreed upon definition um, that is only one, that is uh, uh, not a multifaceted, not a multidimensional, of course, it can provoke some clashes between national legislations. Um, but at the same time, this is the reason why it's so important uh, to have multilateral cooperation in this particular issue, uh, especially now in this global world and the interconnected world uh, where we live. Uh, uh, we are all connected by social media with a global reach. Mm. Thank and you, Claire. David, um, as Teresa says, it's all about um, addressing hate speech while respecting freedom of um, expression. Um, how do we do that? Well, that's that's an excellent question, and um, and I think one of the things that Ms. Ribeiro really highlighted that's that's quite important is that these issues come up in different forums, and so I think it's useful for us, and in particular, uh, Dr. Jalassi's uh, reference to the uh, working definition may be helpful here as well. It's useful for us to distinguish what we might think of as the state's restriction on expression. The state's effort to, for example, um, limit hate speech, if we're using that term in a, in a general sense, versus other platform, other um, authorities, you know, such as a social media platforms uh, efforts to restrict expression. 
And if we think about it in those ways, then we can think that, well, if we're talking about a state's restriction of hate speech, the bar is fairly high for the state to actually criminalize speech. And that's because of the robust nature of the freedom of expression, but also it's a recognition that there might be uh, opportunities, there might be situations where it actually is important to address hate speech. That is the kind of speech that is hateful that constitutes incitement. But we might look to different standards, standards that are still drawn from human rights law that recognize freedom of expression, but address hate speech on social media platforms, for example. And there the working definition might be particularly helpful. But we can look to different standards uh, in different uh, circumstances and different environments. Mm. Uh, David, uh, both you and Teresa have mentioned uh, social media. I mean, perhaps, uh, Teresa, let me just ask you now, uh, the title of this panel is um, Addressing Hate Speech in This Era of Intolerance. So, you know, why is there so much hate speech now? Is it driven by social media? Is that the main issue, Teresa, that you see? No, I don't think, uh, and we need we need to look at social media as important. I would say they fuel, they amplify, and they accelerate hate speech. But they are not the creators of a hate speech. Uh, the, 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 the hate speech is unfortunately much more rooted in our societies. There are other important factors. For example, uh, the responsible um, the responsible speech of some politicians that, uh, for example, uh, South Division uh, have, uh, have uh, uh, that have a strong power of shaping uh, the public debate uh, and, of course, have uh, the use uh, hate speech as a strategy to, um, to in a way, um, you know, attract more followers. So we have quite a lot uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of drivers uh, uh, of hate speech and social media plays a role in amplifying it, in accelerating it, but I wouldn't say that they are the main drivers. Again, there is another problem which is uh, the business model of the platforms, the business model of the platform is really a problem um, because it, it really bets on the continuous engagement of the users, of the consumers. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that the consumer is more engaged, unfortunately, when there is uh, this kind of, uh, of speech circulating in the social media. So uh, there are many, many causes, um, and, and of course, social media also play a role and an important one. Mm. But don't forget the others. Don't forget the divisions that are explored by the politicians uh, and by the public officials, which I think uh, is, uh, is, is, are also very important, as well as religious leaders too. It's not only politicians, but also uh, religious leaders in certain parts of the world. Mm. Yeah, Teresa, I mean, point taken that it's important not to demonize social media. Uh, they might be the amplifiers or the exacerbators, but not necessarily the uh, creators. Taufik, um, I know UNESCO has been doing some work on monitoring uh, hate speech on social media. What, what can you tell us about the stage that you're at in that particular project? Well, yes, uh, we have been monitoring this phenomenon and actually uh, later this week we'll be launching uh, our World Trends Report uh, on Freedom of Expression and Media Development. I understand the point that uh, Teresa was making about the business model that uh, underpins, obviously, these internet companies. Uh, however, some of the actions that we at UNESCO we have uh, undertaken is uh, campaigns on media and information literacy. We have also engaged in training of judges 
to respect uh, standards on freedom of expression. So far, we have more than we had more than 23,000 uh, judiciary actors trained on regional or international standards on freedom of expression. But also, we have been working sometimes with the internet companies themselves on issues of uh, transparency and accountability as well. So we believe that we have to take these actions on two fronts. One is the supply of information, and one is obviously the demand of information. Media and information literacy is for the receivers, for the users of this information to make them more aware and to make them more uh, critical thinkers before they click on an information with a focus on what is misinformation, disinformation, and what is actually truth-based information. But on the supply side, on issues of transparency, accountability, and privacy, and we are doing that with the internet uh, platform companies. So, as you rightly say, there's the uh, there's the supply and demand. Uh, let's just keep on supply at the moment, uh, David. Something interesting that uh, Teresa was saying, and also Taufik, was you know it's not in their business model uh, to stop hate speech. You know, this is good for business because there's more more, more clicks on this. And um, what do you think social media uh, companies uh, should be responsible uh, for? And, and can you tell us what they're doing at the moment? Right, I mean, I think that that's, that's certainly been true in the past, that the business model of, of social media has been to attract uh, to attract uh, eyeballs, to attract people to actually be on the platform. And the more spectacular the content, you know, people, the more people will share it. Um, we, of course, know that the platforms have also been abused, subject to manipulation by bad actors, whether they're governments or non governmental actors. So, so there's a lot of room, unfortunately, for abuse of the platforms. I think over time, given the public's very significant concern with what many people think of as a, a kind of cesspool of bad content, um, the platforms have begun to, to understand that this isn't really in keeping with their business model. In other words, it's bad for business to have hate speech on the platform, and I think there's more understanding of that. I think right now, of course, all of the major platforms have uh, rules, whether they call them community standards or guidelines, uh, that uh, essentially say that hate speech, however they define it, is not permitted on their platform. The problem is that many of the platforms are so massive that dealing with the kind of content that we're talking about at scale is extremely difficult. And it's particularly difficult when we're talking about companies that may be based uh, in the state where I live, in California, or they may be based uh, elsewhere, and they don't have access to the kind of context, to the language uh, specialties that might be required when one's looking at a place like, for example, Ethiopia today, or Myanmar, or other places where there is very real hate speech that's problematic on the platform. And so there are real questions that we need to be asking. And then the final thing I would say on this is that, of course, governments do need to step in and require a measure of transparency from the companies uh, in, in all of this space. And I think the more transparency we have about what the, the platforms are doing, the better we will be able to understand what the response is, whether regulatory or corporate should be to those uh, to the problems that we're discussing here. Mm. I mean, David, do you think that they are quick enough in removing a hate speech when it's identified? I mean, again, this is a problem that uh, has different responses depending on the place that we're talking about. I think that if we're talking about hate speech in Europe or the United States um, or across North America, let's say, I think the response time is probably pretty decent. Um, but, but I do, do want to say two things. One, looking around the world, that may not be the case, in part because of the lack of language and context, context expertise. But the other problem is one thing that we should recognize is that the greater the pressure on the platforms 
to take down content quickly, the more likely that they're also going to be, feel a pressure to take down borderline content, content that may be hate speech but may not be, content that may be discussion or criticism of hate speech. The pressure to take down hate speech will also almost certainly lead to pressure to take down all sorts of content almost at the point that it's uploaded. And that should be something we should be thinking about critically as well, because as much as we want to deal with the problem of hate speech and incitement, we also want to make sure that government isn't really pressuring companies in such a way that they actually interfere with legitimate freedom of opinion and expression. Teresa, is that something that concerns you, that uh, they might actually be impinging on freedom of expression if they take down content which is borderline or which is not hate speech? And, and are you seeing those sort of initiatives in, in Europe and in OSCE member states? Uh, in Europe, and uh, you know the... the uh, you know, the OSCE has a very wide membership. We are 57 participating states, so which it means it's from uh, from Vancouver to Vladivostok. It's a, a, a wide and a very varied uh, region. Um, yes, sometimes they do, but the problem is that that's the reason why it's so important really to look at the, plot, the, 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 the issue of the platforms uh, and to be uh, and, uh, and really to think about what is the best way. We need transparency, we need accountability, definitely, as David uh, just, uh, just mentioned. And at the same time, um, we need that uh, the platforms are fully aware they are uh, required to respect human rights. This is uh, this is very key because what is happening now in certain regions is that um, the platforms uh, just to stay in some countries um, they uh, they are um, how should I say they. Um, they comply with the requirements of uh, of the authorities uh, to remove some content that should not be removed so we have uh, we we need to find uh, the, the the right way to address the challenges of the platforms uh, the transparency the accountability and uh, we need to take action in order to prevent that an authoritarian model of governance of the platforms will prevail because uh, of the pressure of some uh, member states, some participating states, or some member states uh, of the UN or, or the of the or of uh, of the OSCE or the Council of Europe, whatever. But I think this is also very important. That's the reason why it's, uh, this is a challenge we need to address. Mm -hmm. uh, we are living in a very, very, uh, how should I say, gray situation. As David just mentioned, of course, because of social censorship, which is not good for the business. Uh, the platforms are doing a tremendous effort to solve some problems, to, in a way, uh, not give that, the idea that uh, uh, they just won't, they just don't care uh, about uh, human rights, about spreading uh, hate speech, and they are taking some measures that's true, but at the same time, uh, they are uh, also, um, uh, they are also complying with some uh, some requirements uh, of uh, some uh, states uh, that want them to remove content that should not be removed. Mm. Understood. I mean, Taufik, what is your view on uh, social media companies? Are they doing enough? I know you've come up with 26 guiding principles uh, uh, for them. It is obviously uh, getting the, the balance right. W what is UNESCO's thought? 
Yeah, uh, if, if I may first follow up on what Ms. Reboro said, uh, I f we fully agree that we have to follow a human rights-based approach to addressing this issue. Uh, that's what you have been advocating. Uh, and also I would like here to mention that uh, we have, of course, the UN Secretary General uh, strategy and plan of action on hate speech. Uh, and we are in charge of implementing that along with other UN agencies. So this UN strategy and plan of action, very much dedicated to hate speech exists and we are working on that. And I want here to mention a recent event that took place at UNESCO a few weeks ago, which is a global conference to address hate speech through education. So you may see this again from the demand side, but you believe that we have to make a major effort and incorporate uh, this issue in curricula, in teaching, and uh, to use education to this, uh, to this uh, end. Uh, Claire, you mentioned uh, what we have developed at UNESCO, the 26 high-level principles to enhance transparency of internet platform companies. And uh, this is obviously a process which focuses on content, but also uh, on the due diligence and the redress that is required through empowerment, commercial dimensions, personal data gathering and use, but also data access as well. So this came out of a multi-stakeholder consultations. And obviously one thing that we try to leverage is that we have 193 member states and we try to use this multi-party, multi-actor, multi-stakeholder approach in coming up with principles and standards that we believe can serve uh, this cause. Thank you. Um, let me um, ask you, David. It's very. It was very topical at the beginning of the the, the year when uh, Trump was deplatformed. A lovely new word in English, and uh, <laughs> it was the platforms that decided uh, to take him off uh, social media. Now I know that uh, I think it was Angela Merkel wasn't at all happy about that, thinking that it was giving too much power to the uh, social media companies. Uh, where, where do you stand on deplatforming? Look, I think that it's important for us to recognize that the, that the platforms do create a certain kind of space for different kinds of actors to, um, to organize, to, uh, to manipulate, to build a sense of, um, of worthiness, let's say, of worth in hate speech and trump was an example of that and and i think it's also important to see that in terms of trump's incitement to violence which wasn't exactly hate speech necessarily but an incitement to a kind of political violence that had you know quite fascist undertones to be honest that the platforms decided that this was not the kind of content that they wanted to have uh, sort of coursing through their system and that is, of course, also their right to make those decisions, right? The platforms are also, as private actors, able to make decisions as a matter of their freedom of expression, essentially, as to what is appropriate on the platforms. The question really is whether those kinds of platform decisions should be unbounded, you know, simply based on their business interests, or whether those decisions should be rooted in some understanding of international human rights law. And, and in fact, the Facebook Oversight Board, this board that, that Facebook actually created and, and appointed its members, um, did a, a, conducted a kind of public oversight of this decision and found that one of the things that the platform could have done and needs to do better is to be clear to individuals what are their standards? What is their enforcement going to look like when there's a breach of those standards? And be more transparent across the board when it comes to enforcing them. And so I think that as we, as we talk about deplatforming, one of the key things moving forward is gonna be for us as a public to have greater insight into what the platforms are doing. And from the platform perspective, to ensure that not only their rules are rooted in human rights and their enforcement is rooted in human rights law and an understanding of the harms caused by hate speech, 
but also that there's public oversight uh, of that process, which we don't really have today. Thank you. Um, and I'd also like to encourage our audience to please uh, put questions in the Q&A to our speakers. Um, David, just coming back to something that Taufik said about, uh, you know, this has to be done through a human rights uh, lens. Um, what does that mean? And are any of the social media companies doing it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that means adopting rules that are very clearly rooted in human rights law. You know, this I, this allows us. First off, let me let me say also that Dr. Jalassi's and, and UNESCO's overall approach to thinking about media literacy, um, to understanding of hate speech and media on the one hand, but also social media in particular, is extremely important both for the short and the long term. As, as the companies develop these kinds of rules, I think we have a very good basis in the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights, which say a number of things. On the one hand, they say to states, you need to protect human rights. You need to protect them according to your obligations under human rights law. But at the same time, they say companies need to adopt publicly, transparently, human rights policies. They need to conduct human rights due diligence, that is impact assessment, whenever they adopt a new, uh, a new product or enter a new market or decide to leave a market, what kind of due diligence are they doing in order to ensure that they're not um, interfering with, having an impact on human rights? To the contrary, what are they doing to prevent or mitigate that harm? And then the other issues of remedy and transparency flow into that as well. But all of those require policies by the companies. So we've been looking a lot at the uh, supply side of things. Um, in passing, everybody's been mentioning media literacy. Um, Teresa, what is OSC doing on media literacy? It is obviously really important that uh, the public can analyze uh, content. Yes, it is. And I think uh, we should look at media literacy under a double perspective, which is uh, to look at uh, to enable the users not only to, to, to have the right skills to navigate in the very turbulent waters of, uh, of this, uh, this information flow, but at the same time to be responsible producers of content to this uh, uh, social media. So as consumers and as producers. And I think this is very, very important. So media literacy uh, should look um, in this double perspective uh, to the issue. Um, what we are doing, you know, we have now quite a lot of demands coming from the participating states uh, in order to be more active in regarding media literacy. Uh, and my intention is uh, uh, to start uh, looking at it and uh, looking at it as a cross-cutting issue. This is important for hate speech. This is important for disinformation. This is important for the platforms. So this is is becoming more and more present and should be more and more present uh, uh, in our uh, in our work at the OSC. Mm -hmm. And there is a demand from the participating states, definitely. I mean, Teresa, would you agree with Taufik that uh, it's um a sort of whole of society uh, uh, approach. It's about media literacy, but also education is something that's uh, needed. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I think that uh, uh, Taufik, but also David, they, uh, in a way, they, they were very clear regarding this, uh, uh, this whole of society approach, because we need the private the private sector, we need the states, we need the, the, the civil society organization, we need the media organizations, and we need the citizens uh, uh, as such. So we need all of them if we really want to tackle and to address the issue of uh, hate speech. Definitely we do. 
and in d- is in its uh, in its different dimensions. Yeah. I mean, David, isn't this? Um, I mean, taking a whole of society approach, I mean, of course, it sounds very logical and, and rational and uh, education and media literacy. But of course, this takes time. And, um, you know, if uh, I've been the victim of hate speech, uh, I want it stopped now. Yeah. What would you say? Well, that I mean, that yes, that I mean, of course, that's true. I mean, uh, of course, these issues require both, you know, long term e- efforts you know, educational ones, policy ones. It requires, you know, let's be honest, it requires governments doing the right thing. And all too often governments themselves are are the ones who are promoting uh, hate speech. But, you know, for the person who is the, the either the object of or the, the subject of, the victim of uh, an attack on of hate speech, again, you know, we need to go back and ask, you know, where are we, talking about you know are we talking about hate speech that has been um uh, kind of a a tool on social media is it the kind of speech that is designed simply although this is deeply problematic so i don't mean to minimize it to push somebody off of a platform in other words is the hate speech a tool excuse me of silencing you know or is it um, a tool of creating physical harm, in which case the state must step in and uh, and deal with that appropriately? And so there's you know there's going to be a different outcome depending on you know where this is taking place, but none of this can happen uh, on its own. You do need the long term and the short term happening at, at parallel levels. Mm. We've got a, um, a couple of. Uh questions uh, coming in from uh, the uh, audience here. Um, Let me ask, um, perhaps uh, David, uh, Theresa might also have a view. Um, The European Commission has a Digital Services Act on illegal content uh, at the moment. I think it's going through uh, the European Parliament. Uh, as it makes its way then to the Council of uh, Ministers. Um, And the uh, writer says some people see this as a census charter. Um, What's your take on uh, this uh, European Commission's Digital Services Act? Well, I'm happy to just say a a brief word. I mean, the the Digital Services Act, which is pending um, and is the subject of very significant debate, in the European system right now, um, you know, has at its core demands for transparency and accountability. And I think that's very important. And I think it's especially important that the that those who are debating and discussing the legislation itself right now really stick to some very basic fundamental principles. And it, it's, of course, the DSA is not um, merely about hate speech. It's about the the nature of the responsibility of uh, of platforms, of the very largest platforms in particular, uh, in an age where they have so much power over public speech. I'm very supportive of a process that leads to the implication, the the imposition of fundamental standards, fundamental human rights, of uh, transparency in that process. And it seems to me that certainly the originally tabled version of the DSA does that. There are some more concerning things that are happening in the debate, but, but I think that at, at the point of departure, the, the need for a DSA is important and it will certainly have implications for our understanding of and the transparency of how platforms deal with uh, problems such as hate speech. Um, Teresa, you're nodding. You're nodding your head. Any thoughts that you want to add to that question about the European Commission's Digital Services Act? No, just to ju- just to join what uh, what David uh, just uh, just said, and uh, and really um, underlining the importance uh, of uh, of the discussions around it and the importance uh, uh, of uh, of having. Uh, a legal, um, a legal tool, and uh, uh, at least a, a, a legal 
um, approach uh, to the questions of uh, responsibility, transparency, accountability, uh, and also um, appeal, um, appeal uh, procedure, because this is important. It's, and again, uh, it's uh, the way to have remedies uh, to in the short term for the one that has been uh, in a way hurt by um, hate speech uh, in uh, in a platform uh, what can we offer to him we cannot say okay in 20 years media literacy um, uh, will uh, will will bring a, a good response to it and so all these appeal mechanisms it's also very important that they are there and that we, we say that they are quick, they can work really, and they can protect the ones that are victims of hate speech. Mm. Um, Taufik, um, a question here on whether you can provide examples of training and education programmes on human rights protection and promotion. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with what uh, the two colleagues have said so far. And what uh, Ms. Ribeiro said just now, that you know, MIL, media and information literacy, takes some time, while maybe some people want immediate action and immediate impact. Uh, we have been working, back to your question, Claire, we, are, we have been working on a number of dimensions and programs. Uh, certainly, in the context of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we were engaged in a major project funded by the EU, actually. Uh, very much to, to fight what you call the disinfodemic and the misinformation. Uh, because, of course, here it's misinformation about the COVID, but it goes all the way to hate speech and speech of uh, extremism, of violence uh, spread through digital platforms and online. Uh, one of the studies we did revealed that women journalists were in particular, uh, let's say, targeted. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned that uh, these actions start online, but then we see the impact of them offline. I think we have like a 20, 25 percentage of women journalists who are subject to this type of speech online or harassment were physically attacked subsequently. So here it is really, we are not de dealing with two different spaces, the physical space and the digital space. We see a continuum while while things do start online and then they follow up sometimes physically uh, we have been advocating a rome approach i mean part of what transcends across our actions the rome approach r o a m which means a human rights based open accessible and multi stakeholder approach this has been guiding all of our work internet, our principles for internet universality, but also the use of these uh, digital platforms and emerging technologies. Uh, so we have done a number of projects in Africa and elsewhere. In Latin America, I want to mention the judges initiative and the training on the standards of freedom of expression. But all of these, or a good part of these, is guided by our Rome framework and by our internet universality indicators. Um, there's, uh, there's another question here which uh, picks up on something that you were saying, uh, Taufik, and any and David and Teresa um, will have this as, I think, our, our final question that's come in, is, of course, a lot of this hate speech is directed at women, um, particularly women politicians. Um, in my own country, in the UK, we've, we've seen uh, you know, the death of uh, Joe jo Cox. Um, so what can be done uh, you know, with this hate speech, which does seem to be very virulent against whether it's women journalists or women pol politicians. Whoever speaks first can answer the question. Teresa. Thank you, thank you. You know, uh, yes, it's very true what uh, Dr. Tofiki uh, just, uh, just mentioned, that there is nothing virtual uh, about uh, uh, about uh, online harassment of women journalists, nothing. And twen in twenty percent of the cases, uh, this online violence transforms in uh, uh, offline violence. So nothing virtual about it, and we need to take it very seriously. And um, uh, you know, we have we are working very 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 hard on this, uh, on the problem of online harassment of uh, women journalists. 
because because of the online harassment, there are quite of a of a quite a lot of women um, uh, leaving the profession. They don't want to be targeted by uh, this constant uh, online uh, harassment. We know the cases. Uh, uh, the cases of Maria Ressa, for example, of this constant online harassment, as well as uh, of the other British, uh, very well-known British uh, journalists, uh, and uh, the kind of uh, the kind of terrible experience they experienced, the, the, the terrible terrible experience they went uh, through. Uh, and we have a project, and what is interesting, this is a project. Uh, for quite a long time, uh, we uh, we did uh, a lot of research. Uh, then we identify uh, the the right stakeholders uh, uh, with which uh, with uh, with which we should address the issue in order to bring some solution to it. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, it's uh, more and more. Uh, well received across the whole region. Um, in Central Asia, as well as in Southeast Europe, uh, everywhere uh, what we see, which means that the problem is there and it uh, is, uh, uh, is being felt as someone that is a very, very serious problem. Um, that's the reason why the interest, the demand, uh, is growing in the OSU region. Uh, and this uh, is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, and we really need to work more on it. Uh, if we don't have uh, women journalists, if we lose them, uh, of course, this will be a terrible blow for pluralism and for, of course, for freedom of expression, but, but also for pluralism for the diversity of voices in our society. So this is very serious uh, and we really need to address this big, big uh, uh, challenge. With my eye on the clock, I understand that we have a Miro board and that people have been working behind the scenes and have been writing down some of the quotes uh, that our speakers have been uh, giving us. There we are. Um, it's now your opportunity, uh, David, Taufik and Teresa, uh, to see whether you've been correctly <laughs> quoted or, or not. But uh, I think uh, there we are. Uh, the ones in bold are most probably the easiest ones to uh, look at. Uh, David uh, K need to find the right balance, of course, between addressing hate speech and uh, respecting human rights. Uh, dealing with content at scale is difficult. Uh, Taufik about uh, the S got to deal with the supply of information and the demand of uh, information. And uh, Teresa with many, many ones, but because there's a light shining in my face at the moment, I can't read them out uh, for Teresa. Um, but let me then just ask each of our speakers for a last 30 second tweet that no doubt will appear on this board uh, afterwards. Uh, Taufik, what is your key takeaway for our audience? I think my, uh, my message here is clearly uh, my colleagues have stressed the complexity of the matter, the crucial importance of the matter. Uh, here to quote just one of the ambassadors at UNESCO, he told me this matter is a matter of national security for my country. I think that's not an exaggeration. Uh, and some of the examples that, that you mentioned, uh, my two colleagues uh, really attest to that. Uh, UNESCO sees its role as a facilitator of a process that requires multiple actors in a truly consensus-seeking multi-stakeholder approach. We need to work together to tackle this issue that is vital to citizens, to our societies going forward. It's truly a global challenge for which we need to come together to find an effective response. Teresa, your final message. My final message uh, is very much uh, is very much convergent to what uh, uh, I heard from Dr. Tafiki uh, 
uh, and this let's join forces let's do it together we cannot do it alone uh, in our in our small corners we have to join forces and david final word to you i think my takeaway would be that um, we're dealing with very important issues here and it's absolutely essential that as as big a problem as hate speech is and as a big a problem it is for the safety of people around the world and for the security of nations around the world, it's essential that our responses be guided by the rule of law, by human rights law in particular, and by requiring from those public authorities or private authorities that are aiming to restrict it, that they demonstrate the necessity of doing so and that they do so with attention to the real harms uh, that may flow from uh, forms of hate speech. Thank you very much. And you can see that uh, those messages were appearing on that board as you were saying them. And I'd like to thank very much Dr. Taufik Jalassi, who's the Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Communication and Information, Professor David Kay, Professor of Law at the University of California, and Teresa Ribeiro, the OSC representative on freedom of the media for joining us. So thank you. thank you and let me say that we're now going to take a 15 minute break and when we come back the chair of GAMAC is going to be moderating a panel on the precursor to genocide and other mass atrocity crimes. So please do join us for the next 15 minutes you have a break. Thank you.